I've used it. I just don't use it often enough. And the camera's working. All right. We are good. We we'll just increase the lighting yeah. here. Good morning, everyone. Um, we are still expecting a few more people. Jake's on his way. <laughs> and big uh, thing for us is the uh, soul winning. We're planning on uh, uh, doing the 28th through the 30th. <clears throat> we'll be leaving here at about 5.30 in the morning and arriving at the Hoyer campsite between 9.30 and 10, depending on how many stops we have to make. I do encourage you to carpool um, to try and save as much money as possible. This is a church event, so we're going to try and fund it with just strictly church money. Um, so it's going to be uh, tight. We're not going to have you know, extravagant meals or anything like that. A lot of you know, sandwiches and we'll, you know, uh, breakfast sandwiches and sandwiches for lunch and then uh, maybe some burgers for the evening. But uh, we're going to keep it simple. So we'll set up camp and hopefully uh, knock our first door by noon. We are not taking a break. We'll be soul winning straight through for four hours. Uh, we can do this. It's not hard. Um, moreover, the temperature is going to be great during that time. So it's not like it's going to be brutal to try and uh, get through four hours. You'll be so excited uh, winning uh, souls. As we recall from the last time, it was just incredibly fruitful and it will likely remain that way. Um, so after so many, we come back to the camp uh, for supper around 5.30. We are inviting all of these people, every last one of these people that gets saved, uh, we are inviting them to our campsite for church service. I will be treat, pre preaching a sermon on why we're Baptist so they get their feet wet and have a strong uh, understanding of what they can look for in a church because there's many of them there uh, you know they may not be uh, as fundamental as we are but at least they can uh, look for the right things and be a blessing in the church that they will be attending so the Sunday service will be uh, at 10 a.m. Um, and uh, Jake is uh, planning on bringing his guitar so we will likely be doing some hymns I'm pretty excited about that uh, we can join uh, in rejoicing with one another and then hopefully some baptisms there's a lake nearby within walking distance so we might be able to do church service and baptize these new believers there's something else we'll talk about during our soul winning presentation uh, with the new converts that hey you want to get baptized we're having church service tomorrow at the Hoyer campground and it, you, you guys know you live here you know there's a lake there you want to get baptized we'll, we'll baptize you so and then maybe we will uh, stop at Joe's barbecue for lunch again it's all depending on if we have enough funds to do that we also have to make sure we have enough Bibles we have plenty of invites that's not going to be a problem so if I get people separated into groups what I want to do is hopefully have you know, uh, one two three, uh, possibly four groups, okay? So possibly four teams, there'll be one speaking partner in each team. And um, you're probably looking at uh, at least 20 salvations that day. So we have to accommodate for, you know, making sure we have at least 30 Bibles on hand or if not more uh, to give away. So um, th that's it for church news, other than uh, wish Jake a happy birthday when he gets here, uh, or at least do so after, that way we're not in, in interrupting the sermon. Um, so that's it for the news. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the, the blessing of being able to come together to worship uh, and, and learn and, and fellowship with one another. Lord, we ask that you bless this message today. Uh, we ask that you guide my tongue. And, of course, blessing upon the soul winning. But we are grateful, incredibly grateful, for the salvations that we were part of. And we look forward to many, many more. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. So today's message is titled, And the world hath hated them. Many churches, 
many Christians, uh, whether they use the terminology or not, cling to uh, the Joel Olstein mentality of this is your best life now. Um, and, you know, when it comes to being a Christian, yes, we can cling to the fact that we have salvation and our riches and rewards will be in heaven. Um, we will receive blessings here, but it's not ever, ever anywhere in the Bible where it says that we will have an easy road. In John 17, 14, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So once a person gets saved, uh, life in this world does not turn to immediate glory, for obvious reasons, because the king isn't here. What does a newborn Christian see? Well, the first thing that they have to uh, endure is their own sins becoming grievingly evident. And every single newborn Christian, if they are truly saved, will look at, well, the Bible tells them that they're, they're sinners, and they're realizing, well, how much, what have I been doing? How have I been wronging God? How have I been against God? They see it. And when it happens, you have a new conscience that burdens you. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. This is Paul speaking. He is so remorseful about the sins that he's doing. This is the greatest apostle, arguably, out of the, the, the twelve. And he is complaining about his own sins. Being Christian isn't easy. Wickedness of the world becomes evident. In fact, it, it should be vexing your soul daily to have to endure some of the things that we have to encounter. Uh, for the righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds, 2 Peter 2 8. This is probably the hardest part um, to, to contend with. Mr. McClellan, would you answer that? Um, this is you, you're contending with with things that you have to see. You're contending with things that you have to hear. The common thing that goes on in an office place, you converging around the water cooler, and there's going to be dirty jokes. Okay, that's minor. Um, I walked into work the other day, and there's a six foot four transvestite in the kitchen. How many of our friends and family are going to go into hell because they don't know God and, and the conditions and, and it has nothing to do with repenting of sin or being a good person? How many of them don't know this? How many of them have no idea that all they have to do is believe? So again, I've seen this within brothers and sisters who are born again. All of a sudden the light goes on. Oh my God. My friends and family are not saved. They don't know. They have no idea what it takes to be saved. They think that they just have to be a good person. That's hard. That's heartbreaking. For by grace ye are saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. We know this. This is part of our continuous work for the Lord. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So we're going to be reading from John 15. John 15 is addressed to the soul winner, addressed to the Christian who works, addressed to, to, to the Christian who is a diligent servant. John 15, in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean to the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. I, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And a man gathereth them, and cast them into the fire, that they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, 
Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father's glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. And the Father hath loved me, so I have, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I will call, not, call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But, he, but I have called you friends. For all things have I heard of my Father, I have made known unto you, ye have Ye have not chosen me, and I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that fruit should remain, and that whatsoever ye shall ask of thy Father in my name, ye may give it unto you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, that the servant is not greater than his Lord. If there they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, therefore they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sinned. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He hateth me, hateth my Father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they have both seen, hated both me and my Father. But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled, that it is written in the law, that they hated me without cause. But when the Comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. So, folks, the soul winner, this is what he's talking about in the onset of this chapter, that's today's reading, the, the soul winner is bringing forth fruit. And he promises to purge us. Purge us of what? Purge us from sins. So that we can bear more fruit. So that we can become more and more like Christ. And yes, He has chosen some to do soul winning. Some to bring the message of the Gospel to the world. Some people don't. There's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't make you less of a Christian. But He has chosen some. Now the other thing you need to know is that because you are doing more work for the Lord, you're going to be hated. The more people you bring to the Lord, you will be hated. In fact, as we look back in our Baptist history, we see many who have brought the gospel were persecuted unto death. 50 million by the Roman Catholic Church, 60 million by the Jews in 1917. This is not uh, a new thing. It's going back to biblical times that they were all persecuted for bringing the gospel. Now, if you find yourself living a very peaceful life as a Christian, well, that's maybe because you're sheltered. Maybe it's because you're not bringing the gospel. People often at, uh, ask the wrong things when it comes to blessings in your life. Okay, God's not intending to give you the big boat, the big house, the, the, the fancy clothes. Our lives as Christians are not intended to be full of, of wealth. We are supposed to be humble creatures. Now, if God does give you, your job as a Christian is to give to others. God doesn't present a person with wealth just because it is, you know, a, it, it's a whimsical thing. Here, have you know, uh, a great job that produces a lot of money. No, He's giving you the, that wealth so that you can provide for other brothers and sisters. There are widows, there are uh, uh, single moms for whatever reason, um, you know, lost their, their, their loved one in, in battle, in any number of circumstances, but this is the job of a brother or sister. This is the whole premise behind having a tithe to take care of people. 
John James chapter 4, verse 3, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume upon your lust. So the people are often asking for things of God that are not to His glory. So when you pray a prayer, you're asking for providence. Providence means that all your things are taken care of, and God promises to do that. Does He promise to protect us in every situation? No, we preached on that the last week. We've seen how the... the God allows situations to test your faith when we preach through Job. Do you desire riches of this world? Well, the first prosperity gospel was given in Matthew 4. If you want to do a little study of that later, this is where Christ was uh, in the desert after fasting. Okay? So, the devil said, I can give you everything. The very first prosperity gospel was preached by Lucifer himself in Matthew 4. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your, your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift you up. James 4, 9 and 10. If you're not in a humble position, you're not in a lowly position before the King, you're in a prideful position. You're saying, I got this. You don't. <laughs> Gone. You don't, and he and he will humble you. It With grandeur comes woe. Expensive cars, expensive repairs, big houses come big bills. The more stuff you have, the more others will covet and take if they can. Will you take any of this with you to heaven? You know, it, it's funny that is a very strange notion. There's people that I've seen, people that I've known, that literally get buried with their Harley. Oh yeah. People that get buried with their money. There's an old joke, I'm going to share this with you. The very wealthy man said to his wife, when I die, I've taken my money with me. And he wrote it in his will and his lawyer had to abide. So what his wife did was write the entire sum of his money on a check and put it in his coffin. <laughs> Um, yeah. I'm taking a U-Haul with me. <laughs> so, uh, you can't take it with you, folks. Heaven has got everything we ever wanted and desired. Everything. If it, as long as it's holy and glorious. But God promises us all those blessings. God promises us no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. So, when we're talking about things in the world, if you're starting to look and realize that, well, I'm not suffering. Um, everything seems to be great. Well, you might not be a bold Christian. What about associating with people that are wicked? Ephesians 5.11 says, uh, we should have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And, and yet I see time and time again where people are rubbing elbows with some of the, the most wicked people. And I'm not saying that they're, you, you should not associate with bad people because you need to give them the gospel. But if they are so wicked, you should not be associating with them. And we know at wicked, that wicked level that I'm talking about, I'm talking about reprobate, I'm talking about something that God has already given up. First John, 2 verse 17, and the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that hath done the will of God abideth forever. So, again, all these things of the world, all these riches and glories that people pursue are going to be gone. Everything, gone. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, and we will abide with our Lord forever. If you think that this life in this world has gotten better uh, after you become a Christian, there's a good chance either you're fooling yourself or you're, you're not bold enough in your faith. You will be persecuted. The Bible doesn't say you're going to have a glorious life. But the reality is that you're saved. Your, your eternal soul is secure. When was the last time that the, uh, the, uh, you made the statement that Sodomite's not going to make it no matter what the world wants to fool themselves with. When is the last time that you boldly say you cannot repent of your sins to be saved is not a condition of salvation? Nowhere in the Bible does that say it anywhere. 
it does tell you to believe, in one book alone over a hundred times. When you start applying these things to the Bible, you start applying things to your salvation, you're basically telling Jesus, what you did on the cross just wasn't good enough. I have to do these things. There was an expression told to me not too long ago that was so powerful. When it comes to your sin, do you take a bath and then take a shower? Is that how it's done? You, you take a bath first and then get, take a shower? No, Jesus Christ is going to wash you with the, His blood. You don't have to apply anything to your salvation except for belief. In fact, the only time it's ever asked in the Bible, in the book of Acts, Sir, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas both told that man, Believe, and thee and thine house shall be saved. They didn't say believe and be baptized. They didn't say believe and be a good person. Because you're not. None are righteous. No, not one. So, if we're applying that to our salvation, uh, that is incorrect. But we must boldly proclaim that so people understand. I had a fellow that I uh, led to the Lord one day, and he was so heartbroken because he, we had a conversation. I was actually driving him at that time. I was working for Uber, I believe. I don't think it was discount at the time. So I was taking him home from a hotel. I knew what his sin was, and I didn't discuss it with him. I just wanted to lead him to the Lord, and he said, well, I'm such a horrible person. I, I, how could I possibly get saved? And I said, well, nowhere in the Bible does it say that God's calling the righteous. He's calling the sinner. So when I led him to the Lord and I expressed to him, you know, the sins that you're committing right now are not a condition of your salvation for you to stop them. It doesn't say that. You should. Because there's a number of people in your life that you're hurting. So I led him to the Lord. It was a very tear-jerking moment. Um, but what ends up happening is that person, now that they have the Holy Spirit, can combat those sins. They have the comforter. They have the great power cleat to be by their side so they can confront their sins. <coughs> Do you stand firm that the Lord has taken away the kingdom from those that call themselves Jews and are truly the synagogue of Satan? Can you boldly say that? The condition of salvation is for the entire world. They have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If they don't, John 3.18 is pretty clear. He that believeth not is already condemned. We have to give the gospel to every creature, not just certain people. You'll be persecuted greatly for making that statement. But it's in the Bible. Christ said these words. 2143 of Matthew, I've taken the kingdom from you and given it to a nation that beareth forth fruit. Revelation 20, to, excuse me, Revelation 2, uh, 9 and 3, 9 both refer to that as a synagogue of Satan. Stand in defiance of patriotity and, and another form of idolatry. You know, if you're putting anything before God, it's idolatry. I see nothing wrong with loving your country. But when you put it before God, it's idolatry. There's nothing wrong with supporting your brothers and sisters. But to raise that up above Christ? And people do. The King James Bible is the only Bible. The rest should be burned. And for those of you who are new, I have some stuff about that for you. But the, the, the reality is, is that if you're preaching this, if you are a bold Christian, you're going to be persecuted. In fact, the people that brought this Bible were killed. William Tyndale was paraded through his own church naked on a cross with a chain wrapped around his neck and he blew off his head with gunpowder while the king laughed. Wycliffe, they hated him so much they exhumed his bones and burned them. So you'll be hated for God's word's sake. The world and those, things, those who like to, to think of themselves as Christians alike will hate you and persecute you. I've had Christians come after me, people that claim to be Christian. I've had threats on the phone, email. Now, there are some that claim 
this this thing uh, regarding us being hated as Christ was hated, they claim this, but they are ridiculously and horrifically wicked. They're known as Westboro. And they should be shunned because they're just absolutely over the top disgusting the wicked. Who in their right mind protests a funeral? That's disgusting. How many lives have they saved from the pits of hell by holding up a banner? None. So they're sitting there with their badge of honor saying, well, the world hates us. Well, yeah, they do because you're an idiot. They seek admonishment. I guess there's a thrill in it for them of some sort. It's almost just like what Christ was talking about when, when the, the, the Pharisees were, were going into the town square and heaping ashes upon their head and tearing their clothes and weeping while they're fasting. They want the world to see. Now, I am genuinely repelled by the feel-good movement. There's nothing wrong with experiencing joy in Christ. But when you start raising it to this level that that supersedes your worship, this feeling of joy and, and the part of this charismatic movement, Christian lives are, are not meant to be that way. If you had the chance, I, I wish that you all would see that documentary called The Insanity of God. Nick Ripkin shows you clearly that outside of the United States, we're sheltered. We are very sheltered. We have freedom. We have the ability to worship. We have the ability to come together. These other countries, they suffer greatly. Greatly. If you have time, that's something that you should uh, watch. I have it here if you want to borrow it. Uh, to get a true perspective of what happens to a Christian. Because they say, no, I will worship my God. I will not bend. I will not submit to you. Many die. Still to this day of being killed because of their faith. For the, that matter, to stand boldly in opposition of any false religion, this will also cause you to be persecuted. I've made this statement many times in sermons, there's no salvation inside the Catholic Church because they're not Christian. The trouble with that is that the most of the world has become to this, this idea that they are part of the Christendom. The problem is that from day one, it was basically the Roman religions, that was masked with Catholicism. So now instead of having these deities, now you have saints to pray to. And the greatest one of all of them was Mary. Mary uh, basically covered Astaroth. So now they worship Astaroth in another form. Even the image of Astaroth is identical. If you look at the image, uh, Madonna and child is the same as Astaroth. So when we preach against this, it's not to, to hurt people. It's intending to wake them up and say, all right, well, we have to give them the gospel too. The gospel is the same for everyone. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now they have a different Christ. Their popes even said that his work on the cross was insufficient. How much more can you do? Amen. You know, the Pope said a lot of strange things, but I'm not going to get into all that. What I want you to know is that we still have to give all these people the gospel. Every single time that I've got somebody saved, almost every single time, they've been going to church all their lives. All their lives. Doesn't matter what the denomination is, they could be, you know, Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, they could be Lutheran, Catholic, you name it. I've even saved Baptists. There was a Baptist couple right here. I, I believe you were with me that day, Rick. The Baptist couple, young couple, been Baptists all their lives, never heard the gospel presentation. They even thought that they could lose their salvation. Eternal is no longer eternal if you lose it. That makes Christ a liar. So, there should be no limit Everybody should be asked, do you know what it takes to be saved? And that will get you in trouble. People feel, 
people, sometimes, and we've experienced this, they get really offended by that. And you're trying to gently express them. It's not about where you're going to church. It's about what God says about your salvation. And they do get they get they get hurt and, and you're, you they feel that you're questioning whether or not they're saved. The reality is a bold Christian will say, I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe he rose again. I believe. That is the number one condition. Otherwise the thief on the cross never made it. So, I'm going to give you some uh, people that uh, had their best life now. Uh, and I'm being genuinely sarcastic. Following Christ, you had Peter and Paul in 66 AD. Paul was beheaded and crucified upside down. Andrew was crucified in Greece. Thomas died by spear. Philip arrested by the Romans and cruelly put to death. Matthew stabbed to death in Ethiopia. Bartholomew was martyred. James was stoned and clubbed to death. Simon the Zealot was killed for refusing to worship the sun god in, in Persia. Matthias was burned alive, and John was exiled to Patmos. There was a rumor that he was boiled in oil and survived. Today we have pastors who are exiled from countries. Exiled. Sent to court, told never to come back. Of course, the Lord blessed him, and he was incredibly fruitful. Uh, he planted seven churches in the Philippines. Within a period of seven months, and the last one is growing exponentially in, uh, in Davao. We have pastors that are, are prohibited from, from going to countries now because of their belief in what God says. Um, there are pastors here in the United States that are in prison for giving the gospel. There are some places in the U.S. that you cannot openly speak about Jesus. This is a free country, but state law could prohibit that. They think that they can circumvent the Constitution. So they're in prison. Um, I'm trying to remember the last one. It was uh, He's got a funny name. I, I, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I can see his face. He's part of uh, one of the uh, producing people from Save Magazine. Pastors are threatened regularly. Some of them get it worse than others. I've experienced this myself. I've gotten phone calls, threatening phone calls. I've gotten threatening emails. My poor wife has to endure this as well. Pastors are restricted to do the work of God. They cannot go to over 33 countries now because of their belief in what God says in Scripture. We can't just go and, and nilly-willy around what God says. You can't just make it up as you go along. You have to abide by what He says here. This is our final authority. If, if God says He's hated the wicked, He did. What makes a person wicked? Let's define that for a second. What makes them wicked is that they refuse God. I don't need you. That puts them in a position where they are really wicked. If they refuse God to that level, they have hardened their heart, stiffened their neck. And they literally, I've had people actually tell me they'd rather go to hell. That's sad. That's a wicked person. And God has every right to hate because He's given His only begotten Son on the cross to suffer. You preach that, you will be persecuted. All He asks in return is that you believe in Him. If you don't, take the highway. It's not that hard, and the promises are great. Salvation is meant to be easy. Christ likened it unto drinking water in the book of Luke when He was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. If you had known who you would ask, you would ask me for living waters. He likens your salvation unto drinking water. So Christian life is difficult. It's not easy. It does get harder. And if we're to carry our cross, what does that mean? Well, I would imagine all the way up to Calvary, wouldn't it? Follow me. Some of us will be persecuted unto death. It's been happened from generation to generation over all the years. It's happened and it's possible. And it can happen here. Let's go to uh, Proverbs 23 together in closing. I don't want to sugarcoat Christian life. There are people in this room that have had to endure persecution in their job and it was a place that they considered Christian. 
because they stood on the word of God. Let go, Pastor. There you go. They stood on the word of God. In fact, in some instances, they said, "Here, here's all the scripture on this subject." And the the the, the higher up said, "I don't want to hear any more about the Bible." Well, wait a minute. I thought this was a Christian company. Proverbs 23, verse 1 through 4. We're going to finish here. When thou sittest and eateth with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. Put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not grievous of dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. So, when it comes to these things in the world, we have no business company. The Lord promises to provide. We should not be given to appetite knowing that Christ will provide for us. We should not be concerned about the dainty meats. Daniel was very happy eating pulse. Didn't want to partake of the king's table. Do we need to labor to be rich? No. Do you need to labor in general? Yes, man will eat by the sweat of his brow. If he doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. So, if we're chasing these things, we are not seeking God's wisdom. And you'll find yourself, when you're not in a humble position, you're not receiving those blessings that He promises us. Because you're basically telling our Lord, I got this, I don't need you. Remain humble. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You for the understanding that our lives are going to be glorious as we are glorified with You and conform to the likeness of You. Our lives will become richer. But the road going there will be bumpy, and we know this. We, Lord, we know that sometimes it's You that throws the stone in our path. And we are grateful for Your correction and Your wisdom. Lord, we ask for blessing upon the soul. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. You know what you were talking about, Do I need to take a bath.